and welcome back. Um, if you if you were with me about 30 or so minutes ago, we were talking about EB1 Extraordinary Ability. And now here I am with Rashmi Shah. I'm Haley Pickard of Basham Shah Immigration Law Group. And we're gonna be discussing I-45 and the nuts and bolts of that. Um, as a lot of people know, uh, with the October 2020 Visa Bulletin, it is the beginning of the new fiscal year. So that means that a lot of people have become current and are able to file their I-485 um, in the month of October. So I know in our office, we have seen a really large influx of people making consultations and a lot of people who have been waiting, you know, since 2010, 2015, 10, five to 10 years are now able to file for their um, I-485. So I'm here with Rashmi Shah. She has done a lot of consultations. You probably talked to her. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Thank you. So nice to be here. And hopefully this will just provide some basic overview of just nuts and bolts, as Haley mentioned, on what to file, what not to file, and what does this all mean? Because dates of filing chart normally is not used. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are playing catch up with what does this mean? And then how does it relate to the dates of the final action date chart as well? Um, so as we're going through those questions, happy to at least give you some more frame of reference into why October has turned into a chaotic hurricane storm, yeah. <laughs> but in a really, really good way. So hopefully we'll be able to answer a little bit more of those questions for you. Yeah, so we're going to highlight some uh, frequently asked questions we've been seeing just that really relate to the I-485. Um, so let's just dive right in. Uh, so one of the ones we've been seeing is um, people who have an EB-2 priority date that's in 2015. We've been at seeing a lot of people asking about the EB-3 gap downgrade. So are people able to do that? What is the process for that? Sure. So EB-2 people are able to take advantage of trying to move to the EB-3 category because if you think about it, Anyone who qualifies for an EB-2 who has at least a master's degree or the job requires a bachelor's plus five will inherently always qualify for uh, the downgrade of just having a bachelor's degree and being kind of siphoned into the EB-3 category. It's not just though as easy as filing an adjustment. There has to be an I-140 filed from the company because the I-140, if you think about it, the approval notice that the EB-2 person has will designate EB-2 on the approval notice itself. So in order to file an adjustment and take advantage of an EB-2's priority date being current on EB-3, the company has to approve an I-140 application being sent, which asks for the designation of EB-3 itself within the I-140 form. So a company can file the I-140 concurrently with all of the family's adjustment of status applications within October. I guess a couple of caveats is the I-140 that's filed can't be premium processed because there's no original perm that's included in the exhibits. Okay. So the I-140 can be filed, but the processing time is going to be anywhere from six to nine months for it to be reviewed by an immigration officer and approved. And only if that downgrade EB3 I-140 is approved, will the underlying adjustment of status applications that were filed will be approved. So again, the I-140 downgrades are pretty low risk. Um, there's not any kind of adjudication on does the person have the skills and abilities and education requirements that the job is sponsoring because they've already kind of gone through that. So more than likely the immigration firm will have all that documentation. The kind of biggest thing is just ability to pay. So the company still has to prove that it has it can have the ability to pay the sponsored wage that was listed in the original EB-2 perm. And they must show financial documentation from the time the EB-2 perm was applied till now. So if your company is sending an I-140 downgrade, well, it's not just one year's of tax returns that they'll be sending if the person's perm was filed in like 2014, then they're going to be sending tax returns from 2014 to right now, you know, 2020 or 2019 at least, because they need to show that they've had the ability to pay the whole time. So most of the time, to be honest, it's a non-issue, but there are some companies that kind of go up and down where that really has to be carefully looked at. And because it's a mad rush to file in October, that's one of the things that can be easily kind of looked over, but it does really need to be looked at properly because the adjustments are only going to get approved if that I-140 is approved. Okay. 
So then, um, so just thinking about how you were saying if someone decides to port from EB2 to EB3, that can be the six to nine month processing time. So say someone who currently is in the EB2 India, I think for October, 2020, it's um, a May 2011 and before. So if someone's in a July 2011 priority day EB2 India, um, should they should they downgrade to EB3? Should they just wait? Um, kind of what do you think is the best solution for that? Yeah, so I think that it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the visa bulletin for like, I would say the next full fiscal year. So till October next year. So, you know, a lot of it also will depend on kind of who wins our November presidential election based on just comprehensive immigration reforms that have been kind of put in place. So like as an example, one of Biden's um, kind of key immigration impacts that he says he will do if in office within 100 days is change the way the visa bulletin is the next full fiscal year. So till October. So instead of, you know, every country obviously having a specific number of green cards that are allotted to it, Instead of like Indian nationals, for example, waiting a lot of time, everyone will wait some time. So if the chart is moved in that direction, well then a July 2011 EB2 date may not be that far off. If our bulletin is kind of going to stay the same, well, likely it's not going to reach September 2011 by let's say October, 2021. So if your company is willing to do an I-140 and help with that, and you think it's going to be an approvable I-140, then there's no harm in asking them to do that. So it's definitely a relationship between the company and the beneficiary. Um, you can also see who, if like the company, you can share the fees if you're the beneficiary and the company is kind of wants to do it, kind of doesn't want to do it, you know, there's also negotiation, negotiating tactics where, you know, that beneficiary can pay for some of it if it is about, you know, company payment of all of those fees. Okay, awesome. So uh, we are getting a few questions. Uh, so I did, I'm going to kind of jump to one of these um, and then kind of jump back to the questions that we have. Sure. Uh, so we have one that's asking about the I-944 um, for the 12 months of bank statement requirements can, can someone send just the summary pages of the of the statements or do they need the full the full statement of itself? I would do the full statement. Okay, the full statement for 12 months. Yep. It's a lot of paper. So our office, the adjustments in the last year since the 944 public charge has been enacted are like three times the size that it used to, mainly because of the 944 documentation. But at the same time, you know, the way our firm files is we want to be as thorough as possible. And I'd rather feel like the officer has gotten too much information than he feels like he hasn't gotten enough. So I would just go ahead and bite the bullet and be thorough with all the pages of all of the documents that the, your immigration attorney is asking for. Awesome. Uh, so going back, can someone file their I-485 with um, an, uh, an approved I-140 from a previous employer if they work with a, a different employer who maybe has not filed an I-140 for them yet? So you wouldn't be able to file based on the current employer that the person works for because they have not offered a permanent job position, but they can, if they're still in good relationship with their previous employer and the previous employer attests that they're still willing to give that position to them once they're a green card holder, then yes. So they can file um, the supplement I-485 I supplement J's basically takes the place of an employment offer letter that goes with adjustment cases. So if your old employer has not revoked the I-140 and also is willing to give you that position when you're a green card holder, there is no harm in filing it if both of those items are there. Awesome. So hopping back to uh, the questions I'm seeing. So if someone is, their status is expiring in L1, in this person, it's an L1A is expiring on December 4th, um, and they are able to file their I-485 right now, is there a way to expedite the EADs, that's the employment authorization document, is there a way to expedite that EAD approval um, if they file now and their L1A is expiring in um, December? Yeah, as of right now, the person that person would be eligible to stay in the U.S. in valid status because they would have a pending adjustment, but they would not be able to work post-December 4th until the EAD is in hand. Um, there's no expedite 
like options, you know, to say there are yesterday, then, yesterday there was some, the Senate had passed some extra premium processing options. Um, I don't want to talk about that too much until, to be honest, the president actually signs it. So we know that it's going to be options. But for that individual, definitely keep up with our Facebook page, LinkedIn page, et cetera, because as soon as anything is enacted to help adjudicating EADs, you know, premium processing is going to be an option that wasn't there before. So we'll see if the adjustment EADs are in there. And if so, that person can certainly take advantage of premium processing that 765 application. Awesome. Um, can, do people have to um, submit medical exams with the I-485 filings? It's not a requirement. So legally, you do not need to send a medical exam with the initial adjustment filing. The case will still be receded like normal. When your I-140 priority date becomes close to being current on the final action date chart, then typically USCIS sends an RFE for it. If you're looking at your priority date and your priority date, yes, you fall within the uh, like dates of filing chart. But if your priority is pretty close to the final action date chart also, then you might want to think about also sending the medical in the initial application if you feel like, okay, in the next six months or next year, that you might be included on the final action date chart for the actual green card adjudication. Because then that's just one less thing that the officer is going to RFE. And then there's one step that's not going to delay it when you're ready. So most of our clients were not sending it unless the priority date is very close to the final action date chart. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I know that's a definitely a strategy um, and we have been getting that question a lot. So hopping back to the questions we're seeing, um, do, do the spouse and the child of the main applicant have to also fill out the I-944? Yes, unfortunately, everyone has to fill it out. Obviously, there's gonna be very limited information on the spouse and any kind of children's form on that, but it's still a requirement that has to be sent. Awesome. So this other one, uh, Servani brings up a good question. I did just want to, before hopping back to our other ones, um, if someone, an applicant doesn't have a birth certificate or a non-availability certificate, what are the options for them? Yeah, so there, so UCS is really particular about birth certificates and we have such a wide range of issues that we see. But you know, from so if you're if you are an Indian national, so the Department of State visa reciprocity table online, they're really specific in terms of April 1st, 1970, before that date and after that date, and what they think would be available. So before April 1st, 1970, it's a little bit more lax because they think that people didn't really get birth certificates in an organized way. Um, so typically we'll do uh, secondary school leaving certificates, you know, birth, um, affidavits from family members who are alive at the time of your birth. Um, post April 1st, 1970, you have to have a non-availability certificate. Um, and plus there's typically we do affidavits and such as well, depending on um, what there, there might be a birth certificate. Sometimes the birth certificates that we see doesn't have the best standard language put on it, depending on what jurisdiction you're from in India. Um, so we do a lot of affidavits and sometimes there's name missings and things like that. Um, but definitely if you, if you are born after April, 1970, and you don't have a birth certificate, you should go ahead and start requesting that from your local authority and your, in your home state in India, because it's going to take time. And if you don't have it for the initial filing, definitely have as many affidavits that your immigration attorney is telling you to do. Um, and just know that you'll get an RFE on that case and you have to respond with the non-availability within 90 days. Yeah. And if you don't, then that case could be denied. Um, so like really limited windows and technically USCIS is, has the authority to deny the adjustment outright if we don't send like the proper um, birth certificate information or non-availability certificate. That's really not really consistent across the board that they do that as long as you provide something like don't just not provide anything because you don't have a non-availability certificate um, so definitely provide what you can and again just to ensure you get our feed for that non-available uh, non-availability certificate at a future point point. and i know we've also gotten a question about um if you if you're 
birth has been registered late. And I think that's another, just kind of adding to that, that's another one that we um, also have just affidavits for late registration as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely not a bar to entry or any kind of uh, big deal, but definitely they would have to also have affidavits in that case. Um, so if someone, after they get there, so they apply for their I-45 and they've gotten the EAD, do they still need to maintain their underlying H-1B, L-1A, L-1B status? So the best practice is to always maintain your work visa status until you have green card in hand. So we have many clients who have been pending adjustment for a while, but we will continue to renew their H-1Bs until they have a green card in hand. This is just that, so they're not resting on just that adjustment pending option that's not approved yet. It's not, it's not completely necessary. You can talk to your company and your immigration attorney based on what their policies and practices are, but for us and our clients, we will maintain their status just to be 100% safe that their current stay is valid and that their green card adjudication has no hiccups down the road as well. Okay, awesome. Um, so if someone's name differs between um, their birth certificate, their education records and their passport, uh, what is, is that gonna be a big issue and kind of what is the strategy in that? Is there anything that needs to be done or is it just that USCIS needs to be made aware of these are the different names the person has on the I-45? Yeah, so on the I-45, there's places where you put your aliases. Um, and so any name that you've ever formally gone by that's on any kind of government documents, you definitely wanna put in that because you wanna tell the officer that you've been known in these with these different types of legal names. Typically the passport and the birth certificate should align. So that's one thing where, you know, sometimes people have to get new passports with new names that align with their birth certificate or they have to show that there's like some type of legal name change. Like if you get married or something, there'll be a marriage certificate. Um, but there's a variety of ways, but typically it depends on what jurisdiction you're from in India, what the ways are. So definitely just speak with your immigration attorney about what you specifically want to do and let them know what your legal names have been on all of those documentation that Haley just mentioned, because you know the birth certificate is the one that really holds. And so everything should be in line with the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we had a question, and so this is an interesting one. Why is a birth certificate required at this I-45 stage when it hasn't been required at the H-1 or L-1 stage? Yeah, so I guess just because you're asking for a very different benefit from USAS. So with H-1Bs or L's or O's or E's, like E-2s, you're really asking to live here temporarily. But for an adjustment case, you're asking to actually live here as a legal permanent resident. So the bar then of kind of the personal information you give to request that is much different. Because they're, they're going to do more background and security checks. And they really want to know, okay, if you're the person asking for a green card, who are you? So what, what is the backstory? What is the document for that? Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, it's another layer and it's just another level of being able to live and work in the U.S. Exactly. Um, so this is similar to the question about should the person maintain the H under, underlying H-1B status, but so say someone gets their EAD, do they have to continue working for that same employer that sponsored um, their I-140 and the green card. Um, yeah, so there are there are some benefits of having a pending adjudication for at least six plus months. So there are some job portability benefits where let's say you have an adjustment case pending for you and you're working for your employer, but maybe two years down the road, you get a wonderful startup opportunity or something and you have an EAD in hand that you've never used. So you could actually use that EAD to get that employment um, your status then would change from H or L, whatever you are, to adjustment pending. So you're kind of make you're kind of taking the risk of your status now in the U.S. is just based on having a pending case, not an approved case. Mm -hmm. um, and also, the job that you take at if it's somewhere else, using the EAD that's given for you with by you by the adjustment, um, it must be in the same or similar job classification then the job that was given to you through the approved perm, you know, with the I-140 that you actually have an adjustment pending for. So you can't, you know, be approved, you can't be sponsored for a, like a software developer position. And then with an adjustment pending case, say, hey, I'm going to go be a chef now. You know, I'm going to be an executive chef at a restaurant, like pursue my hobby of my whole life, you know? <laughs> so like, you know, there's definitely constraints. Typically what we suggest is if you're going to port to a new job, stay within your like SOC code, 
Mm -hmm. that is listed on your perm. So if you're in the, you know, software developer category, well then you should stay within that category itself to make sure that you stay with the same or similar classification. And then it's also easy for an immigration officer down the road. If you are, do have an in-person interview at the adjustment stage when you're ready to be adjudicated. If you are, if you were in a software developer position sponsored I-140, and yes, you, you're using your EAD, but you're still in a software developer position. It could be a senior one, but it's still the same. It's going to be much easier for him to understand and then approve your case at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's do this. Uh, so kind of, um, let's see. So if someone, and I think this might also tie into that question we had, where if you can use the I, approved I-140 from an old employer, but so say you're working with the same employer and you have an approved I-140, but you've now moved up, say, two positions in the company. Can you still use that same I-140, so say you're now a manager, um, but you have an I-140 approval for a software engineer position. Can you still use that um, for your 485? Yeah, that's, that's going to be hard. So only you can only use the original job position that was sponsored and approved for you. So the company actually has to be willing to put you in that position when you become a green card holder. So, you know, for some companies, if the person is, is, has changing roles and they're not similar, like you can't make an argument that job duties are similar, even though it's a more senior position, most companies will just file new perms for that, for that person. So if that company, if you're two positions up than you were, that company likely would file or should file a new perm and then have a new I-140 based on that position. Um, Otherwise, they need to make sure that that old position is open for you to put you in when you're a green card holder. And they have to honestly be able to say that you want to be in that position. So some people were getting a question is that, so if you file, so say you file your I-45 through through your EB-3, Mm-hmm. Um, through your EB3, is there a way, say, while the I-485 is processing, now the EB2 is, is processing faster? Is there any way while the I-485 is pending to file it under the EB2 now? Is there any way to switch between that or do, does someone have to choose, I'm either filing EB3 or EB2? It definitely is a choice. And that that's the hard part is if you do an, let's say you do a downgrade I-140, EB-3, and uh, have adjustments pending. And then in six months, your EB-2 on the final action date chart is approvable, like your, it reaches your priority date. You would have to file new adjustment of status applications to then claim that EB-2 priority date. So it's fortunately, it's not as easy as moving between the chart. So, and it's a lot of money, you know, adjustment of status applications are expensive. So really have to kind of sit down, the beneficiary does and figure out, okay, what do I think my priority date? When do I think it's gonna become current? How long am I willing to wait? You know, what kind of status do you currently have? Like, do you have many years on your H or your L? And so you're not really, it's not an issue. Um, But yeah, it's not easy just because it's a lot of money with adjustments, it's a lot of time and effort. um, And it's not easy to switch between the EB2 and EB3 once the adjustment's pending. Okay. So um, kind of going off of that, it's, it, it's not easy, but it is possi- possible, is that yeah, correct? it is. So would someone, if they have that pending I-45, would they, through an EB-3, would they have to then withdraw that to be able to file the EB-2 through I-485, or can they have both kind of going on at the same time? So what we would typically do is, after you have a pending adjustment back to the EB-2, end up withdrawing like just the pending EB3 one, because likely that's gonna take longer time. If you're current on the final action date chart, the EB3 dates of filing chart, that's gonna take longer than being current on the actual visa bulletin itself. Um, So only once you have a proper like receipt notices from the new adjustments, would you then go ahead and um, withdraw the next case. But that's kind of where, you know, using that EAD, that's a part of your adjustment. If you're one of these people that are kind of going between the categories, we wouldn't suggest using any EAD because then you wouldn't be able to take advantage of something else at that point. Okay, so that's be, that would be where you would need to maintain that underlying status. Exactly, yeah, just to have options. Um, so if someone had, so say they filed the I-485 now, um, they're just waiting kind of, 
what is the process from there? I know we can't give, I know we definitely cannot give solid timings. Yeah, I, you know. I was going to say, I, I know people are asking, <laughs> how long is it currently taking to get the green card? And um, before kind of what was going on with coronavirus, and mm -hmm. correct me if you uh, think a little differently, but it was taking about two to three years um, for people to get that um, based off of what I had been seeing. And probably mm -hmm. now um, it could be the same. I think we're still still waiting to see what happens with processing the I-45s because of coronavirus and how that has really delayed a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the same, I think one and a half to two and a half years is generally what we tell people, but also all of that depends on, you still have to be current on the final action date chart to get your green card. So, you know, for some of these people, let's say like the EB3 category is January, 2015, but the final action date chart is January, 2010. So it could be many years by the time the final action date chart reaches, you know, let's say December, 2014, if that's your date. So for those people, you know, they need to understand it could be a three, four year wait in order to still get an approved I-485. And that also has to do with just that final action date chart. You know, are they gonna reform the way that they give a lot green cards per country, not per country, you know, all of that kind of comes into play at that point. Um, who wins our election? November totally yeah. comes into play, you know, <laughs> like completely does. Um, but just because they have a pending adjustment does not mean at all it's going to be approved just because the final action date chart is what controls that. Mm -hmm. They're just giving an opportunity for people to file for the benefit of having an EAD, to be honest, that's yeah. pending. And then a lot of their kids that could age out eventually, a lot of those kids then under 21 can file and you know have do, not have the worry that they're going to age out in a couple of years if they're close to that 21 year old. Yeah, we just, and I'm, it's so interesting you say that. We, I had someone just ask us um, if kind of having that similar situation of their child could um, age out kind of pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And so is that something to consider going back to that, deciding on downgrading to the EB3 waiting. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about if someone is 16 and they file for the I-485 now and it's pending, does that, can they still apply for permanent residency even if they technically age out by the time the I-485 is approved? Yeah, so that's a good question. So as, as long as they file the I-485 prior to turning 21, they are fine. So if that, like in that scenario, if that I-45 takes five years, I mean, they're still covered because they filed the 45 while they were still young, young enough. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely those, if you have older children and you're an EB2 and you're looking at downgrading, well then definitely talking to your immigration lawyer about a downgrade and maybe really trying to push it forward because the goal is to get a pending adjustment for your child. Yeah. So if they're in that older stage of like 18, 19, 20, um, and we don't know right now what's going to happen with the charts yeah. and your, and your company of course is willing to do the I-140, then there's no harm in doing an AB3 downgrade just so you and your dependents can have adjustments that are pending. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a really great point. Do you, um, I know that there's been some questions or there had been, um, that new number about visa availability. Have you seen that about the 260,000 that was available? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know too much about that, to be honest. Like, I, I can't find enough, like, correct information on it to have, like, to have, like, a legal opinion on it, you know, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, I, I know that had been seen um, and had been quoted, but there wasn't really a, a reasoning behind it. Kind of, mm -hmm. it was a very specific number, like 261,000. Yeah. Um, okay, so if someone is planning to, they're planning to concurrently file their I-140, I-140 and I-45 and EB-3, if their EB-2 dates become current, oh, okay, that's kind of switching to that I-45 I um, to use the EB-2 while EB-3, I-45 is pending. That's kind of what we talked about. Yeah, you just have to file, file, a, file a new adjustment. Um, we did get a question. Um, how can you get a birth certificate? Um, so uh, you would need to, if you're from India, you need to contact um, your local authority to obtain a birth certificate. 
Rashmi did mention this earlier, um, if you were born before April 1st, 1970, um, is that where you would get the non-availability or is that just where you would say no birth certificate? Same, yeah. As okay. generally like, the, um, well, a lot of jurisdictions, the names could be different at the office, but it's like the registrar's office or the, the D county of deeds office. Okay. But um, just going to your local jurisdiction where you were born, you'll, you'll be able to kind of move from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is there any, you know, for the I-944, I know there's those questions about, um, so it's pretty easy if someone is an I-140 and they're the main applicant, but when it comes to their spouse who maybe has been in H-4 status, didn't obtain an EAD, so has just been a homemaker working from home, mm -hmm. but they do have degrees from India, do they need to obtain an education evaluation to include with the I-944? Yeah, you know, we would because at the end of the day, like the education evaluations, if they have degrees, Honestly, it's not that costly. It's you know somewhere between probably eighty-five dollars to one hundred and twenty dollars to get a, just a pure education evaluation. And so we would, if if the spouse already doesn't have it from like previous job or something, we would go ahead and just include it. Okay. And so um, I'm seeing this question: If someone has been approved for their green card, um, is there a specific amount of time that they would have to work with their current employer? Um, I'm not, you know before they would be able to move? Like, with, is, there, is there a stipulation that USCIS said, um, kind of like with the I-140, that if your I-140 is approved for 180 days, it can't be revoked? Is there a similar situation with the I-485? Yeah, so they don't, they don't put any particular dates on it. They're not like, oh, you have to stay for a year. You know, generally, like, just in practice, we say that the person should really stay at a minimum six months, if not more, because at the end of the day, they received a green card per this company's permanent job position that they offered. So you want to you want to show good faith. It's different if the company laid you off, terminated your employment, like that's that's a different scenario. So if you just got your green card and you're working with them and then there's a covid impact layoff, that's not going to come back to bite you in any way. Um, but if you leave like a month after getting your green card, that's going to look really suspicious on whether you thought it was a true genuine job opportunity for you. Yeah. Um, and the only only place it will essentially come up is in the future when you want to naturalize to a US citizen, you want to be able to show that officer that yes, you got this job opportunity for a permanent position, and you stayed in it and then why you left. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so we are getting this question um, consistently. So I did want to readdress it about the medical exam. We talked about it a little bit earlier. As of right now for our office, we are saying that you don't have to, uh, we are not requiring our the people filing for the I-45 to obtain their medical exam to file it now. Um, because as we, we were talking about it, it's just, you know, USCIS is probably going to ask for it again once you get close to your, um, to the date of the final action dates, which is when people actually get their green card approved. So just to address that question, I know Anurag had been asking it a few times, so I did want to address it for him. And then Haley, I think, um, I don't think we mentioned this earlier, but if, if you go ahead and do file a medical, they're only valid for two years. Yeah. So if you're going to have, uh, if you're not close on the final action date chart to having your priority date current, then, and you're, and you think it's going to be more than a two year wait, I mean, that medical exam is going to expire and you're going to have to get new ones anyway. Yeah. And, you know, most physicians don't have discounts because you did a previous one with them. You know, it's going to be, you know, $400 per person again, you know, and they're expensive. So as Haley mentioned, you know, we're not including them unless we think the person really can be approved in a year based on the final action date chart. Like they're that close. Um, but otherwise there's really no point in filing it because it's not a requirement then. Um, Kind of moving over to the I-944, which has been, um, I think, a lot of people's first uh, interaction with it and the public charge. Um, I, you know, looking over it, it, it really seems to just be wanting to collect information about people's um, credit history, as well as if they've had any bankruptcy, kind of what their cash assets are, um, being able to have an education, speak English. Is there anything you think that people should be really aware of with the I-944? I mean, I think you, you essentially nailed it, you know, with that summary. I mean, they just, it, I think it's really about data collection. Like, that's really what this is coming down to. And, you know, what better data than all of your financial history to be put in, where you own property, what you own, what you rent, what you lease. Um, 
And so it is such a pain. You know, the credit reports are a pain to get as well, but it's just, you know, really what's required. And so as thorough as you can be with all that documentation with your attorney and paralegal that you're working with, um, you know, it does take a lot of time to get those 944s together. And we always feel like so nosy on people's lives by asking for all of this, to be honest. Um, but at the same time, under the current administration, we just want to give them and be just be very open with all of their questions on that form so that you don't you're not giving them a reason to say, oh, this is this doesn't look complete. So if someone has, um, say, credit card debt, is that kind of um, is that just something Again, is it just data entry? Is it something they need to be concerned about when filing for the I-944 if say everything else is okay? Is, is credit yeah. card debt They well? don't need to be concerned like about the approvability of mm -hmm. the adjustment case based on having some credit card debt. You know, as long as all the other factors and obviously we would need to do a thorough review on this person and all of that. But just if everything looks good, you have a good job position, good salary, and yes, you have credit card debt. Most people have credit card debt, you know? <laughs> So that in itself is not going, don't worry about that one piece hurting your case. You know, really it's more about being thorough and answering everything else that you can. And I saw a clarification question on the I-944. So the I-944, you do have to include all of your household members, mm -hmm. but it only needs to be completed by those who are applying for I-485 for permanent residency. So if it's yourself, the main applicant, your spouse, and then your child who was born say in India, they would all need to do an I-944 um, and you would need to include them as your household members, but your U.S. child doesn't have to complete one, but they would be included in the household size. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. They're included in terms of like you're financially responsible for them, mm -hmm. but they, they no additional forms are needed for the U.S. child. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm looking over the last few questions we have. I wanted to give everyone um, a second I, in case I, I didn't get to cover any. We have some people who have um, re, you know, kind of come back with more of a clarification question. I just want to let them know we will um, be at, you know, go back to them and we'll answer them after this just because their case probably and their question takes a little bit more thorough answering than what we can do right now. Um, we did see someone just talk about the I EAD. love Haley's face when she raised the question. Yeah, it's, someone just asked about the EAD premium processing that you had mentioned um, yeah. and just like how if it can actually become a reality, but we just don't know right now. Yeah. I mean, essentially, we, we think it, it might be pushed forward just because USCIS is fully funded by fees and they're trying to get as many fees as possible. So, you know, the premium processing option is great. Do they have the officers to handle that? I have no clue. You know, so definitely just keep in connection with our firm, you know, on all our different social media portals or whatever, whatever you follow, just follow us. Because as soon as something happens, I mean, we are very excited for more premium processing options. Um, so as soon as we know on anything about it, we'll let you know. Um, awesome. And so um, just talking about fees also that brought up for me that there has been that recent injunction if people didn't know there has been a recent injunction into the October 2nd planned USCIS fee increase. Um, so just be aware that in case you didn't know, um, I know we had a few people contact us is that for right now, the fees will remain the same. So um, where the, you know, net, where the EAD and the advanced parole are included as a benefit with I-485 with the new fee increases, they were separate filing fees and it did increase it by a significant amount for now. Um, there has been an injunction, so it's not going to take effect. We can't predict how long that is going to be, um, hopefully for at least the month of October, that would be really great that it didn't change in the middle of the month. Um, but really we don't ultimately know if it's going to stop it at all or if it's going to just prevent, you know, keep it um, that way for a little bit of time. Yeah, just, we just got to make sure that on the day your firm is filing your application and is reaching the next day, just make sure the fees are correct for that day. Yeah, yeah. We just need two days. That's all we need. Yeah, that's it. So as we're wrapping up, I really appreciate everyone who came and asked a question. I hope I know that there's a few people and we promise to get to you afterwards. But, um, you know, uh, there are a few people that are asked about predictions. I know that there's no way to predict. Yeah. So, um, you know, we hope that things, you know, what, what has happened in October, I know that we hope it'll happen in November, but we just don't know yet. We have to wait for the visa bulletin to come out. But well, there, I think also let's, let's wait till after the election too. So I think it's visa bulletin, it's election, who's running USCIS, you know, all of those come into play for visa bulletin predictions, just because we're trying to figure out whether it's going to change from 
per country to everybody weights. Because then if everybody weights a little bit, these numbers significantly move forward for Indian nationals is particular. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have to see. If, if Haley and I knew, we would let everybody yeah. know. We're not keeping this a secret. So yeah, we just don't know. Um, okay, well, you know, just wrapping it up, is there anything else you would like to say about the I-485 for this month in general? No, I think that, you know, if you're current or if you're doing a downgrade, just be as thorough as you can to your immigration team that's helping you. So the more thorough you are with responses, you know, the less back and forth they kind of need to do because it's going to be a hurricane for most immigration law firms for October. Yeah. Because, you know, high, our, you know, our kind of high volume immigration practice, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done and these adjustment packages are, are large. So, you know, kind of two things. One thing is definitely needs to reach in, within October. Doesn't matter if it's October 15th or the 19th, right? It just needs to reach yeah. within October. And secondly, and just as important is it's filed correctly with proper documentation and there's no rejection type of item. So the checks look good, the passport photos look good. All of the stuff that comes along with the application needs to be good as well. So definitely have a lot of patience with your immigration teams that are helping you because you know they're helping so many people and these are not easy to put, be put together without a sensitive timeline like this. So I guess that's my leaving message is have patience with everybody <laughs> because we'll all get through this and we'll all file in October, but it has to be good filings also, not rushed ones. Yeah. And uh, yes, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who tuned in. I think that was a really good way to leave it off, Rashmi. Um, if you guys have, I know we didn't get to go all the questions. So if, if you have any questions that we didn't answer, please feel free to message us on Facebook. I'll try and go through all of the um the comments and direct you to the best resources or answer it in a way we can. You can also reach out to us on our uh, website, www.bostonshaw.com. You can ask us a question there. Um, we're more than happy to talk with you and to give you the answers that we can. Um, you know, follow us on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel as well. We're on Instagram. We're on LinkedIn. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find us anywhere to be most up to date on the immigration news. We also send out a weekly newsletter Monday at noon um, that provides you with the most curated immigration news that you need to know. Um, so thank you so much for asking me for joining me. Thank you, Haley. It's been awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.